Ukrainians tend to be very unhappy with the NHS and the fact that they need to wait a long time. I personally traveled to Ukraine last May when the war was still very much, I mean, in, in a bit more active phase than it is now. I traveled to Ukraine, uh, crossed the border on foot just to see a doctor because I couldn't get to the NHS. In Ukraine, a country that was uh, that's at war, I could see a doctor in 24 hours, whereas in the UK, no one would take my call, no one would want to see me. Hello, hello, hello. This is Chris Snowden. You're watching another episode of the Swift Hearth with Snowden. It's a half hour chat show. It's my little show. And I'm uh, very glad that you uh, you join us every couple of weeks. If you do, uh, it's a little half hour chat with somebody I think you'll find interesting. I'm sure that will be the case again in this episode where we welcome Maria Chaplier. Maria, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. Very nice to be here. How should I, I don't know how I should introduce you, really? You, you, you've done a few things, you're doing a few things. How do you like to be introduced? Um, um, I'm a fellow at the Consumer Choice Centre. Um, I'm also finishing my master's at King's College in public policy, and I'm doing a few writing gigs on the side, some research, and um, um, doing something um, to make Ukraine's victory closer has also become a very big part of my life. So sort of volunteering, helping people find some military stuff which you can buy in the UK and all the small things that I can do. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. You are, of course, from Ukraine. Uh, I should explain yeah. this, unless people haven't already guessed. Where were you when the war broke out? Um, I was in the UK. You were in the UK? Um, I was in the UK. I got a 4 a.m. call from my auntie, um, who was in Kiev at the time. She was screaming, crying, shouting, didn't know what to do. Um, and then um, I spoke to my parents who also saw a few missiles flying over their building. And um, yeah, in the next um, 48 hours, um, I decided that um, I can't make myself helpful while, while being in the UK. So um, I drove to the Polish border to get my mom and sister out. But um, obviously driving from the UK to Poland takes um, more than 24 hours and in that time well you're overwhelmed with all the feelings and emotions and you get constant texts about new missile attacks and you're not sure what to do um i've decided together with alex hammond um that we're going to start a fundraiser and we're going to help other refugees since we're going to the border and we had a car so we um, could help um, some well, it's mainly women and kids um, find a safe place in Poland. So very quickly it escalated into quite a big fundraising campaign and we helped um, hundreds of Ukrainian women and kids find a place in Poland. Amazing. Yeah, Alex Hammond, I should say, used to be at the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'll get him on the show sometime to talk about his, his great work that he's doing at free markets in, in Africa and so on. Um, so how, how long were you, were you doing this, ferrying people back and forth from Ukraine? We did it for about four weeks um, and we could have stayed longer in Poland. But um, so I brought my mom and my sister and my cousin. Uh, I brought them to Poland and I was hoping they would stay in Poland at least for a couple of months because in, in the early days of war, everyone was hoping, oh, it will only take another two weeks and then everything will be over and we can come back to living our normal lives. Um, but um, unfortunately, my mom and sister couldn't, they couldn't manage living um, separated from my father, who is not able to leave Ukraine like most Ukrainian men. Um, so after four weeks of trying to help my mom and sister settle in Poland, they decided they're coming back to Ukraine and they're going to stay there regardless of, well, comes what may, they just wanted to stay. Um, so I got back to the UK and then... Um, I was trying to help some other family, uh, some other members of my family go to the UK. And in that case, um, when the UK government launched this um, Homes for Ukraine scheme, um, some of them came to the UK. Um, and then again, in four weeks, they were gone and they returned back to Ukraine. So um, for the same yeah. reason they wanted to see their, their husbands and boyfriends or they got homesick or what? It's mainly being homesick, but also... Um, <laughs> 
it's quite difficult for people in their 40s and 50s who don't speak English to settle in the UK. Oh. And then you have all of those like small things. Ukrainians tend to be very unhappy with the NHS and the fact that they need to wait a long time. <laughs> I, I personally traveled to Ukraine last May when the war was still very much, I mean, in, in a bit more active phase than it is now. I traveled to Ukraine, uh, crossed the border on foot just to see a doctor because I couldn't get to the NHS. Um, so it was quite an, an interesting experience. And in, in Ukraine, a country that was um, that's at war, I could see a doctor in 24 hours, whereas in the UK, no one would p take my call. No one would want to see me. Yeah, I understand that train punctuality is, is better as well in Ukraine, even in the middle of war, than it is in most of England. Yeah, and delivery as well. Ukraine has, um, there is one big private company which is doing a lot of uh, de deliveries. It's um, kind of like Royal Mail, but it's private. And um, after Ukraine liberated Kherson um, a month ago, I believe now, um, the private and public post companies were there within 24 hours delivering parcels and helping people send something to western ukraine or wherever they were, their relatives were so it's quite amazing how ukraine um considered to be highly corrupt and efficient and like all the bad words country um has turned out to be so efficient and transparent in a way you can say so yeah so that's yeah that's something i want to ask you about because i mean ukraine obviously everybody's aware of the situation in ukraine the vast majority of people in this country are, are right behind ukraine in the war um yeah. but it's not probably a country many people have thought much about uh, you know i would say i mean we're fairly yeah. ignorant of most of eastern europe or most of the world really in this country anyway um yeah. but ukraine yeah you're right it kind of has this reputation for for corruption uh, some yeah. of which is, is, is well deserved right I mean, how how do you how would you, it's maybe a difficult question, but how, how would you describe Ukraine, you know, before the war, how was it looking, how was it, what kind of direction it was moving, were things getting better with Zelensky? Um, I, well, if I was to describe Ukraine before the war, um, I think Ukraine was a very highly technologically developed country. Um, you can get one example is uh, you can get all your documents in a single government app. You get your passport, your ID, you can fill taxes, you can essentially do anything at the moment in that app, uh, which is quite convenient. Whereas in the UK, when you come, you need to deal with nine circles of bureaucracy and stuff. Um, then Ukraine has very developed digital banking. You can, and especially during the war, uh, various apps have become super developed. You can fundraise on those apps. You can just one click away from sending your money to um, by, um, I don't know, some military uniforms or whatever you're donating to. Um, so in that sense, Ukraine was very developed. It was very easy to be a freelancer in Ukraine since usually um, the Ukrainian government was very liberal towards freelancers and you would only need to pay like a 5% tax. It was very cool to be, um, to do, um, I don't know, to work in marketing or IT in Ukraine since you don't pay taxes at all. And if you work for a foreign company, you make quite a lot by ukrainian standards and you can still live quite cheap life you can get a fancy flat uh, which is what um um attracted many foreigners to ukraine before the war i think before the war like alex. especially yeah like alex and and, and and many others um i think um, because ukraine was quite open during COVID, many foreigners have especially europeans have discovered ukraine uh, you could go to cafes um i went to a cafe that was meant to be um, under lockdown, but because Ukrainians are very innovative and have um, a healthy um, disrespect for government, you could always find a way around and you can go to a cafe, even though the cafe is meant to be closed, but everyone's happy, so. So yeah, a certain amount of happy anarchy, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just go, going back to what you're doing, I mean, how, how dangerous was it, um, all, all this taking people in and out of, of Ukraine at the time? Because obviously, Kiev is much more peaceful now than it was in the opening weeks of the yeah. war, to say the least. And, yeah. and you were going in mainly into Kiev, were you, or, or all over? No, we were. Um, the way we uh, were doing it is by um, taking people to different Polish cities once they've reached the uh, Polish-Ukrainian border. 
So we are not directly picking them up from Kyiv or Kharkiv or some other Ukrainian city. We were helping them settle in some Polish city, helping them get in touch with the council in Poland so they can get some money benefits and everything else. And it turned out it was um, equally as important as helping people get out of those um, dangerous places um, around Ukraine, because many Ukrainian women, because they are, Ukraine is not a very like traditional or super conservative country. It, it definitely isn't. But still, because women are reliant on men and many women had younger kids, they wanted to go to safety. They wanted to go to Poland, but often they didn't know where to go. So um, in the early days of war, you had the United Nations have all of those big tents on the border. And once you cross the border and to cross the border, you had to spend like five, six days in a very long queue. And it's cold, you're freezing. It's, it's, it, it's crazy what people had to go through to reach Poland. And then you end up in this tent, you have like some companies saying, oh, you get a free SIM card, you can get some, I don't know, you have tea, coffee and everything, but okay, fine. You can stay in a tent for a day or two, but where do you go from there? And that wasn't clear at all. So we helped them get sometimes Airbnb, sometimes hotel, sometimes connect them with Polish people who could, um, provide a stay for those Ukrainians. And it was very heartbreaking. We had um, one of the women we helped had, a, um, she, she gave birth to a young girl um, about, I don't know, five months before the war. And she was like with a baby crossing the border. And it was, it was just insane. It was very, very heartbreaking. Many people didn't have any money at all because they were running from missiles and they're like in Poland and we, we can't pay for our hotel room. Could you help us? So it was, um, yeah, many heartbreaking stories. And, and Poland took more refugees than anybody else. Is that right? Any other country? I or think it so. Romania? Uh, yeah. Poland. I think it's Poland. I, I believe so. And yeah, I mean, that was kind of going to be my next question before. Is like, where were they all staying? So hotels and, and tents and things primarily, was it? It's, um, and well, Many people, when we were in touch with them, um, and when we were, we found those people who were trying to help, they would say, um, we got some acquaintance somewhere in Latvia, Lithuania, or in the UK, uh, but we also need some time to decompress before we decide on what we do next. So they would go to Poland, spend five days or two weeks, or sometimes a month um, in, in a hotel, Airbnb, some, I don't know, shared accommodation. They would sit down, like bring themselves to their senses and then decide on the next steps. Many of Ukraine uh, of the Ukrainians who initially went to Poland, um, many of them um, then um, applied for UK visas or some went to the UK. Many of the people who helped went to Latvia, Lithuania. It just they needed this critical time to sit down and oh, I had I have this I don't know a friend from school who now lives in Latvia and can help me. But from what I know, many of the people who we helped have settled quite well um, and some have returned, but many of them are in the UK. Many have settled in Poland or in the Baltics and they're doing quite well. Good. Do you know roughly what percentage have come back from, let's say, the UK? I, I, I don't know. I, I do not want to take them up with random numbers, no, but I think it's it's quite a big number. Many most, Ukrainians. Most of them are still here, would you say? Most of them are still living in the UK. I would say 40, 40 30, 40 percent are still here, but I think more than fifty percent have returned home. Oh, really? I was reading. Yeah, I think right. so. Well, that's good in a way. I mean, it's good that they feel safe enough to go back, and you can understand why they did want to. Well, uh, what I discovered recently is that this uh, Homes for Ukraine scheme, um, you get a UK visa for three years and you're not allowed to extend it at the moment. And the reason being um, that apparently the Ukrainian and the UK government are in agreement that the Ukrainian government wants Ukrainians who now settle in the UK to come back home. That's why Ukrainians will most likely not be able to stay in the UK after the current Ukrainian scheme visas expire. And what's happening with the war at the moment? I find it a little bit frustrating that the, the kind of the, the war coverage, I've not found to be that yeah. great in this country. Maybe I don't watch TV news enough, but you know, we obviously just had the first anniversary of it and 
you know, there's lots of people paying tribute to Ukraine, supporting Ukraine. But in terms of actually finding out what's going on, I know when the when the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive was happening last yeah. September, it was the same time as the you know the Queen lying in state and everything. So there was basically no news. But I was following it on Twitter, and it sounded. Um, yeah, you know, incredible, and the, the the movement of troops over such a small space, space of time. I gather that now Ukraine are expecting a counteroffensive from the Russians in the next few weeks or months over spring. Is that is that correct? I think that counteroffensive has already begun, um, oh. but See, that's Russia right, didn't make them success. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know with Russia because they didn't make um, a lot of progress on the battlefield. But still, I think they. Russia has occupied about two, no, more than 2,000 Ukrainian towns and villages, which sounds like quite, since the beginning of the war, um, oh, right. which sounds like quite a high number. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, back to your question about um, how the war is going. Um, when I try not to read Western media for um, and, and when it comes to the Ukraine war, uh, primarily because I think there is, which you can understand from the perspective of trying to keep the West motivated. There is a bit of a bias towards making it seem too victorious for Ukrainians, which it is, but there is the other side of the war, um, which is really horrible. And there is a lot of blood. I was speaking to my mom um, the other day and my mom runs a small corner shop. Um, in a small town in Western Ukraine. And as it happens, you would often have like people come together and talk about, oh, I have this gossip, this gossip, someone got back from the front line. Um, and my mom has like the most terrifying compilation of stories. What men who come back from Bakhmut, which is now um, the hottest point in, in, in the Russia-Ukraine war, they say that you would sometimes have disabled people fighting. You have like tons of dead bodies. You have like such terrifying things happening. My friend told me a story about um, um, her, her dad was on the train to the east of Ukraine and he saw a group of Ukrainian soldiers coming back from, from, uh, from Bakhmut. And many of them were just sitting essentially dead in their face, staring in the same point for 24 hours and they didn't move didn't eat didn't do anything they are just i don't know i think ukraine's gonna have to um, come up with some strategy for how we're going to deal with a very big um social depression and consequences of uh, yeah I, uh, social depression in the way i'm not sure that's the correct way to put it it's just there's going to be such a big trauma after all this ends. Even if we are victorious, you get all of those people who, young people who, I mean, they um, they have become fully disabled. My classmate, for example, lost his left leg and he's 26. And you get like so many people of that age who are just going to be many, many disabled men wandering around Ukrainian streets. And um, we're going to have to do a lot of work as a society to make sure they are integrated. And yeah. It's going to be hard. Are we talking trench warfare now quite a bit? Because, I mean, I hear the Russians are kind of dug in, I guess the Ukrainians also. So we, we're, yeah. getting, we're getting like the First World War. There is a lot of trench uh, warfare, as far as I know. I see a lot of pictures um, of Ukrainians in trenches, falling asleep in trenches. Yeah, it, it does seem very much like the uh, First World War type of warfare we have with Russia. Well, it, it kind of isn't because Russia is a nuclear power, but on the other hand, it is. Do you, do you fear a nuclear strike at all, or do you think that's definitely not going to happen? I don't think it's going to happen, uh, primarily because I think Putin just really loves himself a lot, and for him to, and he's created this big empire with all these palaces, which he gives out to his girlfriends and daughters and I don't know people he just likes I can't see him doing that uh, but on the other hand um, um, I read a lot of Russian telegram channels and um, a lot of Russian news and even though I don't like doing that because they're crazy people I kind of feel that I have to to understand what's happening inside their country and it's just crazy how much they hate the West the UK is their top number one enemy um, sometimes even worse enemy than the Ukrainians. Um, so, the, and they are so obsessed with the idea of them 
regaining this world dominance, being a pie again and making sure that they tell the world um, um, how to live in their traditional anti-woke what else way, that I sometimes feel that the Russian society wouldn't mind a nuclear strike because they are so poor <laughs> because Russia is obviously a very poor country, except a few big um, cities in Russia like Moscow and St. Petersburg. And that because of their poverty, you can convince them that this nuclear strike, as crazy as it might sound, will mean something bigger than them. And they will be like, yeah, we're going to make this sacrifice. We're all going to die for the glory of Russia. And the glory of Russia means eradication of the West. So um, they are yeah. crazy people. Yeah, I do watch quite a bit on, there's a very good Twitter feed, I can't remember the name of it, that shows the, you know, the weird, nu- uh, the weird um, evening talk show with that kind of very creepy woman presenting it and they're all incredibly mm-hmm. bellicose on there and i i sometimes wonder like to, to what extent is that stuff approved by the kremlin do you think i mean is that is that oh, what the kremlin wants people to hear it's like let's nuke the west yeah. yeah yeah um they i think the kremlin propaganda works in um in a very interesting way and it's it's kind of genius i don't want to glorify russia but it's so they have a few key people in the media who spread these messages saying that we, in order to protect ourselves from the West, we might need to go nuclear. And they prepare the population months ahead of any formal announcement from, from Putin or some, some other high official. And as a result, you get the social conversations going, Russians getting ready for this, for the idea that a nuclear strike is possible. They did this with the war where they were kind of mentioning briefly that we might need to do this because we won't have any other choice. NATO is expanding and and they have some key narratives that they are using all the time. So I think Russian population at the moment, on the outside, um, well, we don't actually know whether the sanctions are very, very effective or whether they are not so much effective. It's hard to say, Uh, but it looks like Russians who, remain in Russia, they are, by and large, they support the war. And when you support the war, they are like, we're going to go, we're going to do anything, but we need to win. And Russians also have this really weird mentality, and they repeat this all the time in their exchanges. Russia never loses. Russia never starts wars, but Russia finishes them. We cannot lose. We were an empire and all of that sort of stuff. They love making references to their past how great they were and how if there is any threat to their um identity territorial territorial integrity they would do nuclear so i think it's um it's a very different different mindset than people in the west have so yeah russians love suffering and that being the case i mean how how does this end i mean uh, what would it require you know the russians or putin to save face or be given a ladder to climb down or do you just carry on you know fighting forever (laughs) i wish i knew the answer to this question um well um i think putin putin is not gonna back down or he's not gonna try to present some losses on the battlefield as a victory um he's an old man probably quite ill um it doesn't look like he's got he's got much to lose and um he's trying to build his legacy around the idea of bringing back the ussr the russian empire it's honestly a bit hard to say whatever he wants to bring back um so i think he's going to go really far and try to um to um to prolong this war for as long as possible uh, because i think russians think and it might be true from a geopolitical perspective. The war of attrition is going to play to the benefit of Russia, but not to the benefit of Ukraine. For Ukrainians, it's best to have this quick, decisive victory, push Russia away, and we are done. We can go back to rebuilding the economy, helping the people, and building a free, prosperous country. But Russians, they don't care. They have a lot of men who they can keep sending to the war, exactly. send them to the war. So they have a lot of. Uh, manpower 
and um, and they have nothing to lose. Ukrainians are trying to save the people because we want to have like future. We want to build a good country, but Russians just don't care. It's an existential fight for the Russians. So I think they're going to, as long as they can last on the battlefields, they're going to make sure that they stay there. Yeah, well, it's obviously it is the Russian way to just keep pouring men into this yeah. you know, um, meat grinder. But you do wonder yeah. at some point if, you know, if, if the average Russian is not really that bothered either way, you know, it, you being pushed into the meat grinder is probably going to be quite bad for morale, you would think. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. Um, I think Russians will be bothered when they are asked to go to the front line. <laughs> so they're not mm. bothered by the war, but um, it seems that um, many people in Russia have tried to bribe their way out of conscription. Um, and it's also because the government is being, Russian government is being really silly about it. There is all these uh, pictures of, um, um, of the government giving pigs cows, uh, fair coats to Russian women who lost their husbands, whose husbands died in, on, on the front line, they give them sausages. And it's like, it just shows how poor Russia is that women are satisfied with this. Or sometimes you can get like, oh, you get 40 euros. Your husband died a noble death. Here is 40 euros to you and your kids. But the, it's, 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 it's funny in a way, but it's also concerning that the population is so, so poor and so far behind modern civilization that they just they're just like okay fine there is still no protest you get like a sausage for your husband's death and you're still like i accept my fate yeah. all right we've only got a few minutes left i do want to hear about your masters so can you can you tell us what your your thesis is about i gather it's something to do with drugs yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm using um, the entangled political economy framework, which is um, a new framework developed at George Mason University, which is essentially a classical liberal political economy, which says that government intervention into lifestyle regulations um, leads to all types of unexpected outcomes, which was really the case in the case of drug war, American alcohol prohibition. Uh, where you get all the weird outcomes because no central planning, no government from the top can um, predict how the regulation is going to get distributed around all the networks in the society and government um, and, and economy are all obviously interconnected. Um, I'm looking at psychedelics um, and have the I'm essentially applying the network theory to how the uh, prohibition has come to being which would be the result of interconnection between government, economy, temperance movement, conservative parents who were all in favor of banning psychedelics and when temperance movement was, in, in, uh, was very active in regards to alcohol um, and how as a result of this network effect which exists in relation to government, economy and the society overall, the outcomes of, um, of, of prohibition were unexpected but uh, the way to do it would be to disentangle um, psychedelics, alcohol, sugar, anything else, just disentangle it from this morality aspect and just leave it to the market, to the entrepreneurial spirit and everything else, leave it to the scientists, which would be the case with psychedelics. Just let the scientists do what they want to do. Don't try, like, what often happens is that the government is trying to tell scientists what's, what to do. So even though scientists would try to stay independent, you often have government trying to impact their conclusions and everything else. But as the case of psychedelics show, when you when it well you move away from this morality argument that hit, psychedelics are only hippies, psychedelics are spoiling teenagers, it's sinful and blah blah blah, and then you just use science and you just let science flourish essentially um yeah you disentangle it from the crazy stuff and you entangle it with the um, science that leads to more freedom because obviously the best policy is the one that leads to more freedom and policies that lead to more freedom are often not policies that they just are actions of government leaving people alone so yeah in the uk i suppose you know the scientists can't even use magic mushrooms in research. They can use heroin and cocaine. You know, there are people who can get a license yeah. to do that. You can't even get a license for uh, for magic mushrooms or 
like MDMA, I don't think either. Although there are moves afoot in Parliament to try and at least allow scientists to do a little bit of research for it because it's supposed to be very good for yeah. PTSD, uh, which sadly is yeah. something that we're going to see the problem going to be a problem already is a problem in in Ukraine. Um, that's our half hour up, Maria. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely Thank pleasure you. to talk to you. Uh, fingers crossed, obviously, and um, what's going on in Ukraine, but also for your masters as well. When do you finish it? Thank you. This year? Um, yeah, I need to get it done by May first. So it's oh, very wow. close to the okay, deadline. Really yeah. getting down to the wire. Okay, well, I look forward to reading it. I hope you'll share it with me sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you I definitely will. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. And thank, thank you very much at home for watching. This is another episode of Swift Harvest Zone. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. We're back in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you, particularly if you're an IEA donor. You are the best people in the world. If you're not and you want to be, IEA.org.uk slash donate is the place to go. Thank you very much and goodbye. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.